Good morning. Glad to see each and every one of you with us this morning. If we have any visitors, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. There should be a visitation card on the pew in front of you. If you take that and fill it out, we'd appreciate it. If you would, please pray with me at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come here on the first day of this week to to realize your power and your control of this world and seeing the changing of the seasons, the coolness of the weather outside, but the beautiful day that we have before us. And we're thankful that we can come together as your children today, that we worship you and we can praise you, and that we know that without you our life is vain, that there is no hope for mankind without what Christ has done for us. We pray that as we go into this worship service, we'll remove the worries and wants of the world, the things that weigh heavy on our hearts and on our minds, and that will solely focus on you. We ask that you'll help us to participate in each act of our worship, our singing, our prayer, partaking of the communion and our giving, and then of the study of your word that will be attentive, attentive listeners, that we will be willing to apply the things brought before us, and that we'll be very open and true with ourselves in seeing if there's any shortcomings in our lives. We pray that you'll help us to worship you in a manner well-pleasing unto thee, and we ask that you'll forgive us of our sins, knowing that although we try, we do occasionally stumble and fall short of your glory, that we sin against you, and we ask that you'll forgive us of those things. Please forgive us of our sins, in Christ's name, amen. Brother Dallas mentioned how blessed we are. Grace is unmerited favor. We are so blessed, and God is so gracious to us. That's what we're going to sing about this morning. It'll be some old songs, but the grace that was important then is just as important now. The first song is number 365. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide The next song will be number 26. After this, we'll be led in prayer.
Would you pray with me, please? Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, to sing these songs, to offer up prayers, to later hear a message from your word, and Father, to gather around the table to remember your son's perfect life, his death and his resurrection so that we can have a hope of heaven with you through your amazing grace, Father. And Father, for the opportunity to give back a portion of our means to you. Father, we ask you to be with us this morning in all that we do. We pray that we have our minds focused on you and that we've blotted worldly thoughts out of our mind. Father, we Pray that you'll help us to think about the things that we as Christians should be doing. We pray that you'll help us to remember that we're to be a shining light in the world to show your promises to all, Father. We know that we have the privilege and the obligation to teach others about you to help others, Father, in whatever way we can, to love others, Father, as and to, te- and to treat others as we would have them treat us. Father, for we know that we fall short. Father, as we repent of these things and confess our sins, we ask that you forgive us of those sins. Father, we ask you to be with the programs that we're a part of here at this place. Father, we pray for the work in South America, the work in Mexico, the work in India, the work in Africa. Father, the the preaching schools that are teaching those to go out and preach your word. Father, we pray for the children's homes. We ask your blessings on, on all those works. We ask you, Father, to be with the prison ministry the jail ministry, Father, whenever that gets to happen again. Father, we ask your blessings on on all these things that they might yield fruit. Father, we ask you to help us to be a part 
of not only the works here, but Father, help us to be a part of trying to change the attitude of people. And Father, we can do that one person at a time by, by teaching others that we need to treat them like, like we want to be treated, as I said before, Father. We know that your word has the answers to all the problems of this world, Father, and we thank you so much for your word that we can study, that we can obey that word. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. Father, we know that they've strayed from many things that you would have them to do. But Father, we know that you're in control. Father, we know that one day every knee will bow and will, and will confess your son's name. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for all that are, that are here. Father, we pray for those that are sick and those that are unable to be here. We ask, Father, that you help them to regain their health, that be your will. Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. We ask you to comfort them as only you can. All these things, Father, we pray in your Son's holy name. Amen. After Brother Lindell's remarks this morning, we'll sing number 189, if you'd like to mark that. And before he speaks, let's sing number 500. to begin in some of the teaching of Jesus, in fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, and do you have before you Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 that I'll come to, but just now, I want to read the lifestyle that Jesus is teaching all of us before we come to the application he makes in verses 13 through 16. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. 
Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beautiful thoughts, beautiful words, and he's serious about them. And if you want to know how to be and how to live and how to conduct yourself, there it is. Here in the passage that we're about to move to, the Sermon on the Mount, of course, is underway. He's just introduced it. And he directs now his attention away from the multitudes and looks more specifically and speaks more directly to his disciples. And he says to them, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it then be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are charged, we are charged with the responsibility of getting the word out. The Lord, as he looks over the fields, he said, the field is white unto harvest, but the workers are few. Was then, is now. There is a world of lost men and women, boys and girls, out in the field of the world. And they can't find the Father's house because they can't see above the crop that the world is producing. They're perishing in the night of sin. When the cold morning dawns, it's going to be too late because the door will have been shut. The Lord in our text is saying, join hands, brethren. Join hands and be salt and be light for the field of the world. Find those who are in desperate need of your influence and your message. Brethren, one or two can't do that. Even a small cadre within a congregation can't do that. The whole congregation of God's people has to join hands and be salt. We are to be salt and light to reach the lost, the gospel of Jesus, the vital message contained in the words of our Lord. In the Beatitudes, in verses 3 through 12 that I read in your hearing, he says, this is the character that I expect. And if you have this character, then you are a child of my kingdom. If you have this character and are a child of my kingdom, here's your job. Sweep the world. I mean sweep the whole world as salt and light and make a difference in it. One of the things that troubles me is I come to the time that they call senior citizenship is that the work I have done has made not a whole lot of impact across the world. The gospel is powerful. There's no weakness in the gospel. And I know that the other side, the, the people that hear it get a vote, but it troubles me. I wish we had made more difference. Jesus calls on us to influence the world for his glory, to find the lost before it's too late. The supreme matter in the kingdom, brethren, is character. That's it. That's what it is. The character described in those Beatitudes in verses 3 through uh, 12, 14, so there, or 12. The character described there makes it possible for us to affect the world, to make a difference. And it concerns me. For congregations of the Lord's people, we, we, we can come to a point that we're so thrilled about all the wonderful things going on in our lives, and they are, that we, and, and we'd be so happy about it that we gather in little groups and disciple each other and pray for each other and counsel each other and talk to each other and talk about each other. But the fact is, we're always in danger of not leaking hands, joining hands and sweeping the world. That's, that's a danger. 
We are endangered by never coming out of our blissful tower of Christian fellowship, as wonderful as it is. The Lord says that's a thing that we have to do. And the language here is emphatic in the original language. We are the only salt, if you will. And we are the only light that the world will ever know. You can forget about the Democrats and Republicans being salt and light. All of them. It's not even their job to be salt and light. That's our job. The final beatitude is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10, 11. It's transitional and it makes clear our job is not easy. It's not an easy job. And it's getting harder and harder and harder all the time. And it doesn't appear, just looking at it from the outside, have no way of knowing when a revival may start. But it doesn't appear to me that it's going to get better anytime real soon. I hope I'm wrong. God wants us to confront the world and the evil that's in the world. And just because the world persecutes us and reviles us and says all manner of evil against us falsely, just because it seems impossible in a country where the Constitution says no law shall ever be passed, taking away this freedom from anybody, and we're facing uh, challenges all around the country regarding religious expression. Doesn't make the news, but it's happening. There are communities in this country where you can't uh, legally, or by the rules of the HMO, conduct a Bible study in your house. Just because the world makes it tough on us is not an excuse, however, to crawl in a hole and to keep quiet and to hide and to just be quiet and maybe they won't find us because they know where you are. We are to be salt and light in the world, verse 13 of Matthew 5. I want to proceed in this fashion. Number one, let's look at the presupposition in our text. The presupposition is that there's decay and darkness in the world of men. It presupposes that. Where you need salt, you have decay. Where you need light, there is darkness. And the presupposition in this text is we are living in a decadent and dark place. And I'm stressing this morning the fact that, that we have to be, we have to be different. Measurably, visibly different. We can't affect the world unless we're different from the world. And our lives are, and our relationships and our homes have to be different from what typically occurs out there in the community. Without us, the Lord could look on the world as he did prior to the flood and declare the wickedness of man is great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. If it comes to that point, his response will not be pleasant. What does he have? Who does he have to make the difference? He has us. Our world is a desperate world just because they make it hard on us doesn't mean that we can stop preaching somebody's lost out there, lots of somebody's. We must sweep the world, brethren, no matter what the cost is. Noted God's plan a little bit earlier. The plan is dominion on the part of the disciples. That's God's plan. We've got to move in the world, and we need to dominate it. You know, the Chinese are talking about they want to dominate the world. They, that, that, that system that they've got is so bleak. Someone at the door. It is so bleak, and it's so discouraging. We do need to watch those doors, brethren. And somebody besides the fellows in the booth need to watch. Um, he plans us to, to have dominion. In verse 13... We are the salt. Verse 14, we are the light. That's Matthew 5. Verse 16, let your light so shine. What is God's plan to deal with a darkened and decaying world, a world where wickedness has prevailed? His plan is us. That's the plan. You and I. 
There is no one else. There's nobody else. It isn't going to be given to anybody else. It doesn't belong to preachers alone. They'll never touch the people that you touch, can touch. It belongs to all of us. That's God's divine plan. And the pronouns in uh, verses 13 and 14 of Matthew 5 are emphatic. You only are the salt. You only are the light. If you don't do it and I don't do it, then there's nobody going to do it. This morning, we consider the basic functions of salt. Purity, flavor, sting, thirst, and preservation. Those are the basic properties. We are to be pure, gleaming white against the darkness of the world. We are to flavor the world. We are to create a thirst for Christ in the world by the way that we live. We are to sting and convict the sinful wounds of the world that walk in, walks in wickedness. We are to be a preservative. We are to be an antiseptic in the world. An antiseptic can, can restart, retard the spread of infection. And if it weren't for the Christians, the world would be far more corrupt than it is. We are the preservatives, and we are fewer than we used to be, if you haven't noticed. And the way to change the world isn't to change it politically. I have always encouraged my brethren to participate in community affairs and to make your voice heard by voting. I don't tell you who to vote for or how to vote. You ought to do that, but don't don't. Get sidetracked. Because changing the world politically is not going to change it morally. The way to change the world is to infiltrate it with the godliness and the righteousness, the holiness of the Lord, and, it, and affect it from the inside out. Politics is powerless unless lives are what they ought to be. That's where the power is, is in character. It is encouraging to think that God can turn a whole nation and even an entire world around by us. Using us. What a thought. God always uses simple things. He uses mundane, everyday, routine, common things for the most amazing things purposes. When the Lord made man in the garden, he didn't make him, make him of platinum. He didn't make him out of lithium and cadmium. He didn't make him of gold or silver. He made him out of dirt. So all he needed was a little bit of dirt. And when God delivered Israel from the Philistines, he didn't want Saul, the mighty king. He didn't want Saul's armor all he wanted was a shepherd boy with a rock. That's all he wanted. That's all he needed. Take care of a nine and a half foot tall giant. And if he can take care of a, of a giant like Goliath with a kid like David was at that time, then he can use an aging congregation primarily of people like us to do great things. When, when he came into the world, when Jesus came into the world, he didn't enter it by way of a, of a worthy, politically connected, economically powerful family. God used simple things. He came into the world not in a palatial structure. He was in a stock shed, laid in a feed trough. God used a peasant girl to carry the Son of God. No big production, just simple. He chose the 12. And when he chose the 12, he didn't go to all the elite schools in the country. There were some of those, couple of those guys that were well-educated, credentialed men. But for the most part, they were working men. He didn't go to the intelligentsia of the time. He didn't unteach too much, I imagine. He chose some unlearned Galileans primarily. 
And the Bible says not many mighty and not many noble are called. That is as it's always been because God gets the greater glory in the humility of the one he's using. You are the light of the world, verse 14. We move to that thought. Salt and light balance each other in this sense. Salt's hidden. You don't sense it at all. It just melts or blends into whatever is placed in. It flavors and it preserves. And it works covertly to preserve from the inside. But light shines on the outside. Light is open and works visibly. Salt is the influence of Christian character. It is quiet and powerful. Light is the communication of the content of the gospel. Two sides. We live it and we preach it. If you don't live it, the preaching is not going to have very much impact. We, do, we have to do both. And we're honored to do both. On the one hand, from the inside, we affect society's thinking, living by the power of our lives. On the other hand, we turn on the light so everybody can see its radiant truth. It isn't just in our words, but it is in our overt, open, godly conduct. If you live like the Lord directs his people to live in this current environment, you're going to stand out. People will be able to tell a difference. We're not just a subtle influence like salt, but we are to be an open and blatant influence like light. Salt can't change corruption into incorruption. It can slow the corruption, but that's a negative function. Salt only holds back the corruption. We've got to turn on the light and transform that which is evil. Light is primarily indicated in verse 16. And this implies first that they are to see our good works. First, they're to see that. And secondly, glorify your Father in heaven. That means that, we, that we've heard something about our Father. It implies both a life and a message lived and spoken. There, there is overt positive testimony as well as covert influence. In Acts 1 and verse 1, Luke wrote, The former letter I made unto you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He did what he told us to do. Live the life, speak the word. Ever and always, those two things go together. They are linked to one another, the living and the speaking. Our light is a matter of living the righteous life and uttering righteous content. The truth is revealed in Scripture. When you study the Bible, you find that light is related to the knowledge of God. That's the way the imagery, uh, what it portrays. In Psalm 36 and verse 9, the psalmist writes, For with you is the foundation of life. In your light we see light. The first thing we must realize is that God is light. John 1 and verse 1. And if we are to be light, then we must manifest the character of God, his attitudes, his sensibilities. In Psalm 119 at verse 105, J.C. Fenner prayed this without fail when he came to lead a prayer. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And he was right, he was citing scripture. God is light, the word is light. In the New Testament, our Lord says in John 8, and verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God is light. The Bible is light. Christ is light. And this light, we are to shine forth to the world. We're to tell them about God. Share with them his word. 
Speak to him about his Christ. That is, that's what letting the light shine is. It has to be spoken and it has to be supported by a life that is consistent with what is spoken. Psalm 27 and verse 1, the, law, the Lord is my light and my salvation. If you want to know what that light is in the Bible, it is the comprehensive term referring to all of God's revelation, the revelation of himself, the revelation of his word, the revelation of his son, that's the light. And we are to proclaim the message of light in a dark world. We are to be a preservative, a salt in a world that is decaying. In Luke 1 and verse 77, the text gives us the purpose of the Lord's coming, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited to give us light to them that sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. He, he came to enlighten those in the darkness. What he says to us here collectively is, we must then manifest that to our community. He is the sun, we're the moon. He is the essence, we are the reflection. The primary duty of the church is to be the spiritual light of the world. We are to spread the message of salvation, not, not simply sit around and talk to each other, but to talk about what God has revealed out in the broader community. Fellowship is wonderful and rich and exciting, and we've all, uh, I think, been harmed in our heart of hearts by having to be separate one from another during a time of contagion. That's what, but that's what he said in the text was to be done in the days of Israel, remember. He'd say that they isolate the disease, let it burn out. But we've done that, but not without a cost, a high cost. Fellowship is a wonderful, rich, and exciting thing, but sooner or later, we have to be the light in a world that needs it, salt in the world. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 says, For God, who said light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God who ordered the light to shine in the darkness has flooded our hearts with his light. We are blessed people. And we now have the opportunity to enlighten men only because God has given us the knowledge of his glory and as we have seen it in the face of Christ. God passes the light all the way down through us to the broader community. It is so important. It is so vital. We are the light. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 puts it like this. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke. That's it. What's he say? Live the life. Walk the walk. It has to be there, a, a life that is harmless, a life that is blameless, a life that deserves no rebuke. If, if they're going to criticize us, let them have to make something up. Let them be like one of the networks on TV. You know, they just, they'll make stuff up. If they're going to criticize us, let it be that they make something up because there's nothing they can use. And if we are to be hated, let us be like Christ. Hated without any cause. Hated without any justification. Let us be the children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we shine as lights in the world. We're the hope, the only hope they have. We are the lights holding forth the word of life. Jesus illustrates his thought here in Matthew chapter 5. He says we must be visible. We cannot just, just be a secret influence. The light has to shine openly. A city that is set on a hill obviously cannot be hidden. You can't hide that. And the, the point is conspicuousness. We are to be a conspicuous light. 
We're not the Masons meeting off here in some secret place with no windows. Boy, I don't like places without windows, but uh, I couldn't be with that. We're not that. We're not the Illuminati. We're not the whatever. We're not part of the lizard people and on and on and on if you go with all that uh, stuff on the internet. We're not any of that. We're not pagans with mysteries only for the initiated. We don't have a cult known only to a few. No, we're a city set on a hill and the whole world ought to see. We must be sought before we can be like. We have to have the character and the influence before we have a message that is believable and acceptable. That's the plan. There is no other plan. There's a problem, however. If the presupposition is darkness and decay of the world and the plan is dominion by the disciples, then the problem is the danger of failure. The danger of, of our not following through with this great responsibility. There, that's an attendant danger. He didn't ask us. When we became part of his covenant people, he made us salt and light. And we need to be warned because if sin enters our life and we don't walk in the spirit, then we will cease to be effective as salt and our light will not be useless or will be useless. In verse 13, the Lord warns salt can lose its saltiness. I don't know if he's there saying, well, what if it lost its saltiness? Some will say, well, salt doesn't lose its saltiness. But I've also read that in antiquity, they didn't have pure Martin salt like what we have, but that some of it had uh, an admixture of other uh, minerals within it that could degrade and could spoil the effectiveness uh, of the salt, make it not palatable. The Lord's obvious point is, however, that when sin enters a Christian's life, he loses influence. When he loses the ability to wield a good influence for God and he doesn't repent and recapture that, then he allows himself to become useless. If you walk in sin, you have no influence. You can't slow the corruption of the world because you're part of it. The Lord says a light is something set on a hill, put on a lampstand to provide light for everybody. The Lord notes it is foolish to prepare the lamp to give light and put a basket over the thing so nobody can see it. Amazingly, amazingly, we have this gospel within us, this treasure, but some people keep it hidden kind of. They don't let anybody see it. Some, of them, some haven't shared the gospel with anybody in a year, five years, ten years, or ever. If you're going to be the light, you've got to get your light up where people can see it. Jesus is calling for something new. He was saying, you are part of a degraded religious system to those Jews. They degraded it. It, it was given to them pure. They debased it. Now, he said, if you live according to kingdom character presented in these Beatitudes, then you're really going to have to be different than what you are. You have to be light so that all can see it. And that isn't easy because they're not going to like it when they see it, some of them, many of them. It is always the fear of persecution that tends to make us hesitant and a little bit afraid. So after... The beatitude, blessed are the persecuted, he reinforces that with the instruction that we're not to put our light under a bushel, not to hide it. He wants us to put it where everybody can see it so the whole world will know the truth of God. Verse 16 personalizes that. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's all. It's a simple message. Let the beauty of your deeds be manifest. It's not that they are just good in themselves, but they have a beauty and an attractiveness about them that are winsome. In other words, let me see your attractiveness. Show your quality. And it isn't just the good deed itself. It is the beauty that that deed manifests. Let it shine in the presence of those who despise you, who would kill you who would reject you 
and deny you. Let it shine and let them see the beauty of your works. When you hide your quality, you're not doing anything but preventing someone from potentially seeing the beauty of God himself. We've seen the presupposition. We've seen the plan. We've encountered the problem. What's the purpose? If the presupposition is decay of the world and darkness, and the plan is dominion by Christians, and the problem is the danger of failure, what's the purpose? What put, uh, why put yourself at risk? Why do that? The purpose is to glorify God. The end comes in verse 16. The reason for all of this, the one single reason is, that is overarching in the whole universe is the glory of God. This is always the issue. Oh, I don't know if I should stick my neck out. I might lose my job. I might lose my reputation. I might not get invited here or invited there. I might not be able to hang out with some people that I currently do. In that instant, if you begin to give in to that, in that instant you have ascended to the throne and are asserting, I'm going to do what I want to do, and it's more important even than the glory of God. Can a man do that? Can a man lose himself? Can, can salt not be salty? Can light that is lit, lit not be manifest? Can, can you, if you care about the glory of God, but allow your personality and popularity and prestige and reputation to get in the way, can you drag the glory of God down? To ask us to answer. And then your flag goes up. And you say, I reign. And I'll do what I want. Glorify your Father who's in heaven. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus emphasized the beautiful tenderness and intimacy of God. And he says in heaven and there he speaks of majesty and glory. On the one hand, God is tender and a loving father. On the other hand, he is a magnificent, majestic, glorious, sovereign, all-powerful God in heaven. And he is the one that is to be glorified. So what about it? What about you this day? Are you the sort of salt that staves off corruption, that has a preservative influence, the kind of uh, light that attracts the beauty of holiness uh, as the shining of your goodness and the beauty of your life is shown, the power of God is released in you, and it touches people around you? Are you that person? Do you ever mitigate it or cover it up so that it doesn't shine. I believe God is going to call on us in the days of head. And I could be wrong, but it's what I believe. Looking at what I'm looking at and hearing what I'm hearing. Some open sources, some not. I believe that he's going to call upon us to stand up and be counted. In ways that we have not been required to before in our lifetime. I think of Hebrews 12. We've not yet suffered under blood. I can't know what the future has for us, but I know that we need to come to grips with our lives in the here and now. Where are you investing your time? Where do you invest your life, your money? Where are you placing these things? You only have this one life, just like I do. That's all we get, one shot. Let's resolve that we're going to make a difference in the world. Because the world needs us. It's evident that they're not being well served or well cared for by the governments of the world. They're not getting it done because they've turned their back on God. We're the only salt and light there is. Let's be different and let's make a difference. Will you now, if you haven't done so, make covenant with the Lord? If you've not come to him on his terms, would you take care of that this day before we leave this place? 
If you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, it's the terms of pardon that he establishes are that you believe that he is Messiah and that believing that, you repent and turn away from sin, embrace the light that he is, and confess his name before men with the assurance that he will confess you before his Father who is in heaven. And would you then consent to be buried with him in the waters of baptism where he washes away every sin? Would you do that and rise up to walk in the life, light, manifest in the light of God? I hope so. And if there's any need that anyone has, and you can be helped by the church praying for you and with you, we're always willing, even anxious to do that. If we can help, please come now. As together we stand and sing. Before we gather around the table this morning, let's sing number 644.
We have the opportunity at this time to partake in the Lord's Supper on this Memorial Day uh, feast, during this Memorial Day feast. Let us pray. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful to have this opportunity in this beautiful Lord's Day to partake in this bread, which represents the body of your Son, Jesus, that died on the cross for our sins. We just ask that you be with us as we partake and that we're able to do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we have the opportunity to partake in the fruit of the vine, which uh, represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for our sins. Let us once again go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we are thankful to have this opportunity to partake with this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your son, Jesus, the blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. We just ask that you be with us and enable us to partake of this in a manner that pleases you. In your son's name we pray, amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have a, an opportunity to give back as we have been blessed. Uh, there is a box in the, uh, in the back where you may uh, put your contributions. We just want to remind everyone that it is back there. and We're no longer passing the trays at this time. Once again, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again just to have an opportunity to give back a just a portion of what we've been blessed with. You've blessed us with so much in our lives, throughout our lives, and we just hope that uh, these contributions are able to help further the work of your kingdom uh, throughout the world. We just ask that you bless us and those that are giving and that those contributions do help bring others closer to you. These things we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. If God grants continued life, I plan to speak from Psalm 25. Unto thee I lift up my soul. And I hope that you'll come back tonight and be a part of that. Let's be standing for this minute. Shall we pray? Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you give us in this day. Pray that these lessons and sermons that we've heard from your word will take and be, as Brother Lindell said, the salt and the light to the world for you. We ask that you be with all those that are ill and heal them and bring them back to your health, their health and help them to be of service to you. We ask that you be with those that have lost loved ones recently and help them to cope and to do better for you. We ask that you bless them. Ask that you be with those that have situations in their life that they need to address and help them to address in a way that you will be glorified. We ask that you be with our country. Bless them and guide our leaders to do your will so that you will be glorified. We want to thank you for your mercy and for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.